Before I begin, I owe an apology to Mark Williams and the children um, in my enthusiasm, <laughs> both for Lola and Jackie and Amelia. I, I skipped and I said, Mark, I'm so sorry, but let me just say something. Every single week, every single week, you bring us the message you were sharing with the children today, which is a message of joy. Every single week, you shine God's light to each and every one of us. And every single week, you bring us hope. And you've done that for 15 and a half years, never failing us. So thank you. I'm sorry, but thank you. Thank you, thank you for the joy and the light of God that you bring to us, Mark. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Are you a person who has dedicated your life to one focus or one purpose? Are you someone whose pursuit of a product well made, a way of living well lived, or an idea or a motto, um, sort of a driving principle of your life, a purpose of your mission, a certain truth guides you, that it's so clear that it governs you in a way that moves you to achieve the things that are before you, that come to pass, and it delivers you day by day to do good in this world. What I'm trying to ask is, is there any way in a number of ways that you're more like John the Baptist than you ever imagined? See, I believe we have a lot more in common with John than we think we do. I don't see any of you dressed in wild clothes or eating locusts in the one hand and wild honey in the other. Perhaps you do that when you're not here, and I just haven't seen it. But I do believe you thrive on a regular diet of good deeds and good works. I do believe that you have figured out for your life how to shape the lives and affect the lives of others. I believe that. I believe there is something that drives you, a life commandment, an inner directed truth that guides your life. For example, for those who are teachers, the idea that no child is ever left behind is a guiding, driving principle. It may be something you live out in education or in care of another person. In terms of the change that you can make in this world, you make a difference because of something that moves you. Perhaps you believe that my factory, where I work, doesn't make junk. We make great quality things, we produce the highest quality product, and we deliver it on time and guarantee its excellence at the highest level. I'm looking at your family <laughs> because I know you do. I know that's what you've dedicated your lives to. For John, it was simple. As he went into the desert and baptized in the River Jordan, it was this. Confess all your sins, repent of those sins, and turn your life around, come back to God. That was his guiding principle, his life commandment. The work of confession is always something between ourselves and God. It can be done in the silence of a darkened prison cell as it was for John on his waiting moments before he was to be beheaded, or it can be shouted from a rooftop for all to hear. There are those of us that would really like it for those of us, for somebody else to shout their confessions from a rooftop and admit all their sins before everyone. But I believe ultimately it comes down to this. It is an I and thou experience. It is me and thee. It is about every child of God speaking directly to God. For John, that wasn't all of it. The turning around was complete when you had received the new word that the Messiah was coming. So it didn't just end with what you said coming out of baptism. It ended with him in the, in the hands of Jesus. That's why 
it's so important for him to get an answer to the question, are you the one who is to come or should we wait for another? And what does Jesus say to John's disciples when they bring that question to him? Because remember, John is about to die, right? Jesus tells his disciples to go and tell John what they see and what they hear. It's very simple. The blind receive sight. Those who could not walk are walking now. Those who are diseased with leprosy are cleansed now. The deaf hear now. The dead are rising from the grave and the poor have finally had good news delivered to them. That's what he tells John about his ministry. What do you see? What do you hear? That, my friends, is a, de a definition of the year of Jubilee in Scripture. It's the deliverance of prophecy. The hope for all the nations is happening because Jesus has come. You can't make this stuff up. When a politician asks when they're running for some office or another, they ask, are you better off now than you were four years ago or two years ago? Now, all of us go through hearing that question going, hmm, yes, no, maybe, you know, and then the ad's over. So. But there's no denying that all of the changes that Jesus brings through his ministry are for healing and teaching and making a profound impact in people's lives that is palpable and clear. And I believe it still is. See, I see that people who truly follow the risen Christ in their lives are changed for the better. They bear a peacefulness and a joy that guides them each day. They focus on the best in others, not the worst in others. They lift up and celebrate the gifts of the Spirit alive and well in this world. And then they step into the world to share those gifts with others. They see the light in the darkness and they focus on hope. In the words of Paul in his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus' disciples live into this daily routine of transformation, which is this. We know that God causes all things to work together for good with those who love God, to those who are called according to God's purpose. What if you were to carry this focus, this attitude, this formula, this purpose for daily work life and interactions with others out to Monday morning, every single Monday morning. The light of Jubilee would shine in a whole new way in this world. It was what Jesus was here for, but it's what John was clearing the path for and then Jesus paving the way for 2,000 years ago, to walk in the glory of God to be part of fulfilling God's love and purpose in this world. In his little book, The Dark Night of the Soul, written from the darkness of his prison cell in the 16th century, St. John of the Cross illumined our path out of darkness and into the light of God. John was a very small man, less than five feet tall. When he arrived at the Carmelite, Monastery, or the convent, I should say, where St. Teresa of Avila, not yet a saint, by the way, meets him at the door. She opens the door and sees him and says, oh, so the church has sent us half a friar. What a great welcome at the door. <laughs> like her, he was a Carmelite. It's an order founded on the ideals of a simple life spent in solitude and prayer. John was taken prisoner by other priests because he stood with the Carmelite nuns in Avila and they believed he was a heretic. So they took him to a monastic prison. Yes, there are such things in 1577. For 11 months, John was left in a dark cell with only bread and water. He was not allowed to bathe. He was not allowed to change his clothes. He was only allowed out once a day where he was whipped and flogged by priests. He began writing his reflections, the dark night of the soul, in his mind's eye because he had nothing to write on. He had no pen, he had no paper. That would later come, but when he started, he would just memorize his words and turn them into prayer. 
And those words, as they were memorized, were finally put to paper when one priest was kind enough to bring him paper. And then he would sit in this cell with no windows. And when the light would come through a crack in the wall, he would use those hours of the day to write the book. Now, his book was not what you think. John doesn't say much about religion, although you think he could say a lot when he's sitting in there under those conditions, right? His language is passionate, and it speaks to the senses. The Dark Knight is actually a love story, full of painful joy expressed in relation to the most elusive lover of all. John doesn't offer any help to anyone seeking a better grip on God. In fact, he emphasizes that God cannot be grasped. In John's native Spanish, his word for God in The Dark Knight of the Soul is nada. God is no thing or nothing, no thing. God is not a thing. Since God is not a thing, we cannot hold on to God in the way that we want to. God can only be encountered as the eclipses of reality come to John in the cell in new ways. John writes about what God is not. He wants his readers to be clear and to clear their hearts and minds of all images and ideas that they hold about God, which become obstacles between them and what he calls the real thing. He takes all the language which we hold as fully understood about things like sin and salvation, repentance and grace, and turns them inside out and upside down. For example, rather than giving an understanding of sin like we would do, he points to a deeper understanding that sin is really about betrayal about brokenness, about forgetfulness, and about our own deadly distance from the source of life. I believe this shift, this nada, should be liberating and not confusing. God as nada, as no thing, should be received as it was delivered in the dark night of the soul. It should be received as a gift. We all know Christianity is changing. In the words of theologian Phyllis Tickle, we are in the midst of a great rummage sale, which the Christian church through the ages holds from time to time. We have accumulated a lot of junk in our houses, and we are ready to put it out on the curb to show everybody our old worn out hymns and books, our old worn out sermons and ideas, our old worn out theologies. They just need to be put out there for pennies on the dollar. And by the way, if you come after 12, it's half price, right? I love what Harvey Cox says about this time that we're in, the future of faith. He writes this. He calls this time the age of the spirit. We can no longer hold on to our old ways. They just don't work. They don't work. We can't just call them to be perfect and good, and therefore they'll straighten themselves up. We must be changed by young and transforming voices who are calling us to a new way of seeing things, a new path a new way in which God, no thing, who is not dead, but is in all things, can come to us. Sometimes it takes a 600-year-old, four-foot-something monk to show us the way forward. It all started with a question. John just wanted to know, before I die, are you the one? who is to come, or shall I wait for another? Now, waiting is relative when you've got minutes to go before you lose your head. Jesus doesn't abandon him. He says, you tell John what you see and what you hear. Give it time. So if the disciples of John were to come here. What would they see? What would they hear? Let us lean into the dark night of the soul and let light break through the st stones that we have constructed to shine a shiver, a sliver of light onto the hope of all nations. Amelia, I'm talking to you. Yeah, I know you're busy. But the future is yours, my dear. Belongs to all the children here, those that are setting up downstairs and they won't disappoint us in just a few minutes. 
So you better go and see what they have to show you about the truth of the gospel. Don't be afraid of the dark. Out of our darkest nights come the dawn of morning in which God's light shines. And in the bright morning star, we will always find